Hey guys, I have a bit of a headache and I'm using that as an excuse to jump on a video request that was sent in a little while ago. MJ asked if I could do a mumble ASMR video, just talking about story ideas, discussing my favorite parts of different plots kind of talking about what's coming up, and um, at least from the way I read it, rambling about whatever I want, which is kind of what I tend to do in my comment sections anyway. I've been slowly gathering different kind of ideas for this for a while now, so this is going to be semi-scripted and somewhat just off-the-cuff rambling. The basic idea is that this is going to be a little more chill than what we usually do, a little bit less scripted, and just that it should be kind of soft and relaxed enough and interesting, but not that interesting enough that it would be really good to fall asleep to. I don't know about you guys, but... There's a sweet spot for me when it comes to videos that knock me out, and I'm hoping that maybe I can fall into that for you guys tonight or whenever you might be listening. Just a friendly reminder that while I do take requests, you won't necessarily get what you want. I'm like an evil genie. I grant wishes, but I also ruin your life. So first up... I'm going to jump into something that I've kind of mentioned in a comment here and there, and sometimes I think it causes a little confusion, or people think I'm more intense about it than I actually am. Obviously, as a keyword, the stuff I do falls under ASMR, and I would argue this video probably counts as that, soft-spoken only, but I think it probably does count as ASMR. I do think some people who are doing role plays definitely count as ASMR and are kind of doing like that ASMR artist thing and generally have like that relaxing voice, something you can really fall asleep to. Maybe they're doing some specifically very nice sounds or triggers. Um, I don't think that's what we're doing here. If you like my voice, perfect. If you fall asleep to it, cool. But I'm not intentionally giving nice sounds. If I were doing an ASMR channel, there would be a lot more tapping and significantly fewer gore sound effects. I spend a lot of time thinking about things like what it sounds like to slit someone's throat, and that does not scream tingles, tingles, tingles. Tingles, tingles, tingles. <laughs> but I do really like ASMR. And it's actually something I was listening to a little bit earlier because, again, I have a headache and I find it really helpful for moments like that or just kind of relaxing in general. One of the founding ideas behind this channel is that not every script has to have darling in it. There are plenty of pet names, even for our psychotics. And I like to use a variety. There are a few characters where it specifically fits their vibe, including some non yandaries There are also times when I use it as a sort of shorthand. So depending on how out there the script idea is, sometimes I intentionally lean into cliches to kind of provide a sense of grounding. For example using Darling as kind of a shorthand for the Yandere's, like, obsession or their person when you specifically aren't that obsession. Maybe when you're a third party or something like that. Another good example there would be during the Angel and Devil on Your Shoulder scripts. That one leaned really heavily into the kind of school life cliches, just because it was already such a weird concept that I really wanted to have it grounded in familiar ideas so it was a little easier to catch up. This is also partially just because I do tend to 
have shorter scrubs. So there's not necessarily a ton of time to really dig into the background and establish setting and establish character. Miscellaneous scripts that are fully written. They are guaranteed to come out eventually, whether that's a week from now or a year from now. But if I see a lot of interest for something, I'll probably bump it up. This fundary is all red flags, but red is my favorite color. Yandere regrets killing the competition. Mean Girl comforts you? The villainess was also isekai and now she's obsessed with me? Yandere in a time loop tries to protect you. The demon terrorizing you thinks you should break up with your SO. You think my spouse murdered someone. A hungry vampire was not expecting this much enthusiasm. Mean Girl picks up cursed necklace. Cuddles with your sleep paralysis demon. You sold your firstborn to a witch. That is going to be one of my rare F or F exclusives. You're a yandere, but I am a gold digger. Couples therapy with my yandere spouse. Mean Girl protects you. First day of school. There are a few more, but I think those are the highlights. The first script in the You're a Yandere and Your Wife is So Tired playlist was inspired by a few of Yonkon's videos. A fair amount of his videos are kind of comedic takes on Yandere's, really most of them are. And in some of them, he seems to have an actual relationship going on with the listener. And you can just tell that, like, the Yandere is barely being kept in check by the listener. I started thinking about what the opposite side of that looked like and what kind of person could actually handle having this Yandere boyfriend on a leash. And that's how we ended up with our character from that series. Another fun fact is that I lean really heavily on the concepts of the four horsemen of divorce for that series. So I'd have to look it up to really get into it. You know what? I'm going to look it up. I'm going to be right back. Okay, so criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. Specifically, um, she's really heavy on criticism and contempt. My character, um, there tends to be a little more defensiveness and stonewalling on the listener side, but really it's mainly focused on her criticism and contempt. To be fair, their marriage kind of vacillates between like oddly wholesome and kind of healthy and two inches from divorce. At the same time, there really is no divorce when you're dealing with a Yandere, so I have a certain amount of sympathy for our main character there, insofar as the fact that she can't necessarily step away from the situation. She knows that, and that really pisses her off. That actually leads really well into another thing that I think I use in a lot of my scripts. Not just the Andere scripts, but the Mean Girls as well, which is that characters are often viewed via comparison, and that's why oftentimes I don't like my non... how to put this? I prefer to have my characters balance each other out by both being terrible people. 
or at least by both having like noticeable flaws. Generally speaking, everybody looks pretty good next to a yandere, but the yandere also looks a little better next to someone who's, for example, a gold digger or incredibly mean or very critical or what have you. You also have the situation where the yandere kidnaps like the criminal. Same thing goes with the mean girl. She's going to look better depending on who you surround her with. You also have the idea of antagonists in that setting. I think it's really common for a yandere character to be put up against somebody who is equally despicable, but perhaps in a different way or a way that's considered less honorable. It essentially frames the Andere in more of a white knight light, or at least in a light where their feelings are genuine, which helps to make them seem a little more lovable, I guess, or at least somebody you can root for. There are very few truly normal people, either on the speaker or the listener end of my channel. That is pretty uncommon. Um, just a lot of times where they kind of offset each other and where you end up rooting for someone who you might not root for otherwise because of that comparison. The setting also really impacts how a yandere looks and how good a yandere looks. I think a really good example of that is my zombie apocalypse script. A girl who is extremely violent and extremely into you is 10 out of 10 in a zombie apocalypse, and her possessive tendencies probably aren't going to matter that much when um, pretty much nobody living is around anyway. It's a pretty sweet deal. So I'm going to ramble a little bit about one of my FRF scripts because I've thought too hard about it now, and I jotted something down. So the script is, your best friend proposes to you out of nowhere. You know, just the general concept of, hey, you keep dating horrible men. Why don't you marry me instead? You know, there's nothing gay about that. So I started thinking about, you know, just the general fact that I would absolutely watch this movie. And... I kind of jotted down what would be the plot points of it and kind of like the silliness and that rom-com vibe. I gave them names because I feel like that makes it a little bit easier, but I gave them names that are kind of shorthand for listener and speaker because I felt like that helped too. So we got Lauren and Sasha, Lauren for listener, Sasha for speaker, our girl who proposed is Sasha. Lauren is the one who got proposed to. You know Lauren walks away totally baffled, because what even was that? Has her best friend Sasha secretly been in love with her this whole time? Is Sasha having some sort of breakdown? Is it awful that Lauren is kind of thinking about it? She's staring up at the ceiling while her boyfriend is snoring next to her. She's thinking about it. All right, we're cutting to Lauren at her high-powered job. This is a rom-com, so I'm just going to assume she's the editor at a fashion magazine or something. It's a total madhouse. She gets back to her apartment, and the place is a mess. The boyfriend is totally unsupportive. Big fight. Dramatic breakup. She storms off. She's standing out on the street. It's probably raining. Again, this is a rom-com. We're just leaning in. She picks up her phone. She calls Sasha. Okay. I'm in. Let's get married. Sasha is so relieved, partially because Lauren said yes, and this is going to be the best decision they've both ever made, partially because Sasha was seriously starting to think she should cancel the venue and she was never going to get that deposit back. Lauren goes to her sister, asks her to be the maid of honor. The sister is the only sane person in this movie, and she is like, Dude, you broke up with your boyfriend like five minutes ago. What are you doing? And Lauren responds, They say you should marry your best friend, right? The sister is over here like, That isn't what that means, and you know it. I'm throwing in a couple other side characters, because why not? 
You've got the boss who's like 50 and very unhappy in his marriage. He is significantly more invested in his subordinates' lives than he ever should be. When he finds out about the situation, the boss is clearly projecting. Oh, so you're going to marry this girl, but you don't love each other, and you never have sex. Yeah, that sounds like marriage. At least you know what you're getting into. Lauren's parents don't really understand what's happening, but they are liberal, and they understand just enough to be pretty sure this is a gay thing. They are trying to be supportive. It is too much. It is too much. So anyway, our girls get married. They're buying a house. Lauren's killing it at work. She is editing the hell out of that fashion magazine. She's got a wife back home, and they are just tag-teaming life. They have a kid together. Maybe they adopt. Maybe they go the sperm donor route so you get those cute pregnancy scenes. The whole time, they are just slowly circling each other, and the tension is building and building. They're always hugging and pecking each other on the cheek and cuddling and accidentally falling asleep together, even though they do have different rooms. But this isn't that different than how their friendship always has been, so it doesn't set off alarm bells. There's probably some third act drama. I'm not really a fan of third act drama, but it just seems to be the way these stories go. About 20 minutes out from the end of the movie, Lauren is having this vent session with her sister and suddenly has the realization, oh my god, I'm in love with my wife. There's a big confession scene, and they finally kiss because this is a rom-com, and I don't make the rules. Cool, I've been recording for a really long time, and it just occurred to me that I should double-check that I'm actually recording because it's been 22 minutes, and that would be very sad. Fair warning, I am probably going to cut that down a fair amount, but also so much less than I do a normal video. I do like my retakes. So, at one point, a commenter asked if I use different microphones because my sound changes so much and, like, the quality changes, and the answer to that is no, because ultimately, um, the microphone is only part of getting good sound. So I have been playing and I have been experimenting, yes, my first two videos um, were literally just thrown together on my phone because I had written a couple scripts and I was kind of impatient to get a good fill and I had kind of this, Psh, I could do that vibe and decided to just throw something up with my potato quality sound. But ever since the third video, it has been the exact same microphone I have, however, shifted around quite a bit and changed my, um, recording, I'm trying to think how to describe this, uh, scenario, recording situation, recording setup, setup sounds right, I changed my recording setup quite a bit, so for my first few scraps, I literally just recorded them at my dining room table. Decent amount of space between me and the mic, as well as the fact that um, my dining room is a little bit echoey. So I didn't love that. I started doing some kind of sound tests around my apartment, trying to find a decent place, hoping I didn't pick up too much highway noise, because I get a lot of that around here. And my second setup involved a step stool on the floor of my bedroom because I got some carpeting and I've got some bugs and it's just way, way, way less echoey and it was much better sound. Most recently, I'm still hanging in my bedroom because pretty good sound, but I'm mostly just kind of standing by my dresser and keeping my mic a lot closer to my mouth which, fingers crossed, seems to get better sound, um, and probably just as important to me, gets a lot more volume. I don't know about you guys, I don't like listening through earphones or headphones if I can help it, 
I'll do it if I'm kind of out and about in the world because I'm not a jerk. But I much, much, much prefer just blasting it out if I'm like in my apartment or like in my room. I'm much, much happier listening to it properly. And it always drives me crazy when the volume on a video is too quiet and I can barely hear it. I want enough volume that if I really crank it up, I could like do the dishes and still listen to the video. And I think I've kind of got it there at this point. Like you can always turn the volume down, but ultimately I'm the only one who can turn the volume up. So I really want to deliver like lots of volume so that you guys can listen, even if you're like doing chores at the same time or like half paying attention or not like right up ear to computer listening or wearing headphones. I'd rather have that option. So as long as I'm just trying to ramble and ramble and ramble, I'm going to put a recommendation out there. I need more people to play the game Dead Wishes on Steam. It's like $10. There basically isn't a fandom and that's really offensive to me. There's a lot of content for that $10. I want to say it's like 10 love interests, 50-50 female to male. And the concept is that every love interest is a yandere. Not all of them necessarily fit my definition of a yandere, but still lots of yanderes. Trigger warning for Mateo's route, just in general. If you have any triggers or are kind of sensitive, Mateo is not going to be a good experience for you. I don't think Mateo is a good experience for anybody, really. I like when horror makes me uncomfy, and even I had a couple genuine what-the-fuck moments. Also, the romance route for one of the characters is locked unless you get all the main endings for everyone, and I haven't gotten around to that yet. Although that character is a literal god, so she's probably out of my league. Does anyone have any good game wrecks for Yandere's that are fully released games? I feel like there are a lot of demos out there, and a lot of them are really good demos, but they're still stuck in that demo stage. I'm kind of keeping half an eye out for a fair amount of them, but I'd rather see more things that are completed. Also, any suggestions for games with female yandere's where the character is either gender neutral or girl? Because I just can't stand being shoved into the perspective of a high school boy. No offense to any high school boys who are listening right now, but that is not the that is not a headspace where I belong. I did recently play Amnesia. The only thing I knew about it going in was that one of the love interests was an unexpected yandere who put you in a cage. Every time I started a new route, I had to ask myself, is this a man who would put me in a cage? Which upon reflection, isn't that different from normal dating? I love the idea of yandereism being genetic. I just think there is so much potential there and so much comedy potential there which is why it shows up in a fair amount of my scripts, sometimes as the main concept and sometimes as a little bit of a background thing. I also like the idea of trying to figure out what a Yandere comes up with as their worldview when Yandereism is really common in the family. So that's why, for example, in my The Talk, video. The Yandere's obsession is usually referred to as their soulmate. Like, it just makes sense from their perspective that that's your the soulmate, that's your person. Everybody has one of those in our family. It is so normal, honey. I feel like in any, in any sort of, I guess it would be kind of a second person framing, you know, anything like my scripts where there's a listener and you're speaking to sort of the vague listener, not getting too deep into like descriptions or what have you. There always has to be some level of description, 
right? Like, obviously, we're not getting into, like, appearance or even gender most of the time. Often, it's all very vague. But at the same time, usually there's some level of description of the person. The person who's speaking has opinions about that person. You know, there's framing about how that person acts. And oftentimes, that's not really going to jive with the listener themselves. So it's very easy to be like, whoa, I don't know who this like kind-hearted, shy, whatever person you're talking about is. That's not me. That is not I. One thing I like about Yandere's is that we're already going in with the assumption that they are deeply delusional. And personally, I feel like that helps with my suspension of disbelief a little bit because they'll describe me and I'll be like, "Mm, that's inaccurate. But is it out of character? Not necessarily. Maybe they're just wrong. Maybe they're just putting me up on that pedestal. Maybe they're just nuts. Honestly, I think I can get away with a variety of scripts. Primarily because of the fact that I consider romance tertiary to my channel. I like a little bit of romance. I like reading it. I like writing it. But ultimately, I'm not necessarily catering to the romantic side in every single video. Sometimes I lean a lot more into horror. Sometimes I lean more into the comedy side of things. Sometimes if a romance is happening, you're not even involved in it, or it's kind of like a background thing. And I think that lets me get away with a little more and come up with some very different ideas. I've kind of run out of things to say for the moment. And I think I've rambled enough that I can probably pull something out of this and get a decent video and hopefully not decide that I'm sounding very, very silly and need to delete everything I've ever said. So I'm going to wrap it here. Good night, guys.